Well, good morning. Welcome to East Bay Calvary Church. Welcome to our special Sickness Sunday. If you, uh, if you have not gotten the flu or something like that so far this year, boy, you're weird. This, this has gone around so much. I just can't believe how, how uh, thick these Michigan germs are around here. People have asked, have you been enjoying this flu season? And I said, no. <laughs> Anyways, just want you guys to feel at home here. <laughs> hey, uh, you know, when you feel sick, you feel defeated. You feel down. Feel like maybe this is the way everything is. If you feel bad, everything must be bad. Well, I just want to encourage you. Everything is not bad. Just we are, that's all. But everything isn't bad. And in fact, there's some great things going on. And even though we're a little depleted this morning, I want to encourage you with a few special things about our ministry. I don't know if you know, between... July and December, we mentioned this at our annual meeting, we grew by 10%. Did you you know that we grew by 10%? Yeah, and you're even allowed to clap for that. You probably didn't know this, though. In January, we grew another 10%. Isn't that incredible? So at this rate, in 34 months, we're going to be 6,000 people. I just want you to know. So if you all could scrunch to the middle to give some room, um, but that, that's just fantastic. It really is fantastic. Last week we had a new members class. We had 27 people come. And that fan, people actually, they, yeah. So not only are people enjoying it and catching the vision of what God's doing here, but they want to belong. And truthfully, we want them to. So we're just excited for those things. We just recently brought on our own Sarah Fischel as our children's ministry director. She has been working so diligently, and we're, we're excited about our new ministry endeavor coming up. April 8th is our launch date, and I am thrilled. My kids are thrilled, and, and we can't wait to see what God's going to do beginning April 8th for that special um, pilot program that we're going to have in kids' ministry right here at East Bay Calvary. And then we recently just brought on a hosting greeting director. This is not a new name or a new face to our ministry, um, but God has led us with the number of very positive responses for that ministry position. God has led us to bring on our very own Anna Smith, and I am looking all over for Anna. Where She is right here at the sound booth and waving at us. And so we welcome Anna as our new <clears throat> hosting and greeting director. We had about 20 individuals sign up with interest for that. We know that there are many others here who would do extremely well in hosting and greeting ministry. We want guests to feel very welcome when they come here and be led all the way from the parking lot to the pew and to really sense that this is a place where they belong. We want to make it user-friendly for them. And Anna's here to help us, and we all need to rally along with her and, um, and encourage that ministry to happen. I have been out of commission this past week physically, and um, this week is a little lean for me, but beginning next week, we are working with our ministry resource team to get that part of our mission for 2018 all set and on track. So uh, if it seems like a lot's happening, the reason is because it is, Uh, but good things are happening. Amen? It's really great. So I hope you are ready to go for our study here this morning. We're in the book of Esther, and I invite you to turn in your copy of the scriptures to Esther in chapter 3. 
And if Esther is a new book for you, or even if it's not, you may need a little help finding it. And so here's what we've done to make it simple. If you open up your Bible about halfway, uh, somewhere in there is going to be Psalms or maybe Proverbs. And then just go left because before Proverbs is Psalms, before Psalms is Job, and before Job is Esther. And that's one of the easiest ways to find the book of Esther in your copy of the scripture of course, if you have an iPod or an iPad, it is E-S-T-H-E-R, and that uh, will make your search a little bit simpler to find Esther in chapter 3. Last week, we talked about Haman, <clears throat> and Haman was a character introduced in Esther chapter 3 who had some very deep-seated problems. The first one that we talked about that he had was the problem of pride. And today we're going to talk about the challenge that he had that really took him for all he was worth and finished him, and that was his problem of bitterness, his problem with bitterness. Bitterness normally starts small. It starts as a seed, and when stuck in the incubator of our minds, it grows and grows until it consumes us and monopolizes our thoughts and it compromises our actions. And we all have had those seeds, those seeds from hurts get planted in our mind. We've all had those times when they have grown in our thoughts and we have dwell on that individual and the challenge that has brought to us. And after a while, we have been consumed by it. And it's even changed our thinking. It, it reminds me um, sometimes how our thinking can get so disrupted by bitterness and anger. Um, the one individual that was talking to the store clerk and pleading their case, and they were getting more and more and more upset. And Finally, at the very climax, they just screamed out, you made me so think, I can't even mad straight. In bitterness, we give into handcuffs that bind us and hold us. They hold us to our worst thoughts. They hold us to things that we would, we would never, ever want to imagine. Memories stay too long. Our imaginations pick up and picture great retaliation. We become eaten from the inside out, and others may never know what's going on inside our mind when we're consumed with bitterness. We'll stay up late. We can lose sleep. We can get preoccupied away from our work. We can daydream thoughts against others. That's exactly what we see in Esther chapter 3. So if you are there, how about you stand? And I just want to read a little longer section <coughs> this morning that's going to deal with the full narrative of this passage. In Esther chapter 3, the full narrative is seen in chapter 3, verses 5 through 15, about Haman and what he was dealing with. And then we're going to look at some quick understandings about bitterness and how it affects us. So here we are, chapter 3. I'm just going to read verse 5 through the end of the chapter and I'm having you stand because I'm reading a long passage and I know what happens if you're sitting there for a long period of time and you haven't been feeling well. So, hey, if I can't fall asleep during the message, neither can you. Verse 5. When Haman, that's who we're studying today, saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, 
the poor, that is, the lot, was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day and a month, and the lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, there is a certain people dispersed amongst the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all the other people. They do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. And if it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them. I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman. Do with the people as you please. Then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out the script of each province, the language of each people, all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of all the various provinces, the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself, sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day, of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. The couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command. The edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city of Susa was bewildered. And as you can see, we have a little task at hand. So have a seat. Let's get to work. If you want, go ahead and grab your study guide with us this morning. <clears throat> and we're going to be working through a few understandings of the issue of bitterness and how it impacts us from the inside out. So we'll see today that not only was Haman overcome by pride, Haman was also overcome by bitterness Follow along here just for a moment. I want to give you some of these blanks to fill in. The very first one here regarding bitterness, this truth about bitterness, is bitterness consumes people. It consumes people. And as a very good example to that, I want to give you some thoughts about Haman. Number one is we look at his name. You want to talk about how ironic this is how we can see scripture and how God certainly has a tremendous sense of humor. The name for Haman means rage. Isn't that something? Haman means rage or to be turbulent. What a bummer of a name, huh? It means a level of intense anger. And there is a unique play on words as we look through this chapter 3 of Esther. If you look at verse 5, just looking at it, you see something really special. If you understand his name means rage, it says, When Haman, or when rage, saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. He couldn't hold it together. His reputation and his name bore witness to that. And here's some evidence of his rage and his bitterness consuming him. He was consumed with revenge on Mordecai. He was consumed with revenge on Mordecai. Once again, this little play on words in the Hebrew, Mr. Rage was enraged when he saw Mordecai wasn't bowing down to him. And he constantly had these thoughts that he had to do something about it. He couldn't let it go. I just want to show you how ridiculous this got. Just look over at chapter 5. Just over a page at chapter 5 in Esther. I want to read for you just a few verses here from 
the account, and we're going to see something really unique about Haman. Verse 9, he was just invited to um, by Esther to meet with the king and her for a special dinner. So Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits, but when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate, observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted them about his vast wealth. Listen to this. His vast wealth, his many sons, all the ways the king had honored him, how he had elevated him above all the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she's invited me along with the king tomorrow. But notice verse 13. This is so telling. All this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. Really? He had all of this going for him, all this wealth, all this popularity, all of this honor. He was even invited to this exclusive banquet. The king, he and the queen, he had all of that going for him. And then he says, you know what? It means nothing. It means nothing because there's this one guy in the entire province of Susa who won't bow to me. So he's losing it all over one guy. He was consumed with this revenge. Chuck Swindoll says this. Anger is an erroneous zone. It's kind of fitting for right now. A kind of psychological influenza, he says, that incapacitates you just as a physical disease would. He says, anger is a choice as well as a habit. It is learned reaction to frustration in which you behave in ways you would rather not. Then he goes, in fact, severe anger is actually a form of insanity. Can you get a little feel for that from Haman? This guy was losing it. He couldn't pull it together. Here's a couple other things about bitterness. Number two, it can ignite. It can ignite crazy reactions. Where did this take him? Let me work you through it quickly. Look at verse 7 back in chapter 3. All this came about. He's all upset about Mordecai, even though he has the whole world at his hands. He's all upset about one man. And in verse 7, in the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the poor, that is the lot, was cast in the presence of Haman, to select a day and a month, and the lot fell on the twelfth month, the twelfth of the month of Adar. This may not make a whole lot of sense, but let me give you letter A. Haman treated life flippantly. He cast lots, or the poor. Essentially, it's like rolling the dice. And here's his whole concoction. You know what? Let's kill these people. Let's kill them. And you know what? Let's figure out when we're going to kill them figure out when we're going to kill. Let's just roll the dice. Let's just cast a lot. See what day it falls on. It's almost a game to him when we're going to take these people out. And in verse 13, it shows exactly who he was going to take out. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, annihilate all the Jews, young, old, women, children, all of them on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, to plunder their goods. This guy was losing it. He was so consumed with this. His bitterness escalated to the point that it now affected everyone around. It affected him. It affected all the Jews. And if you look at the very end of verse 15, all the people of the city of Susa, they were just bewildered, like, 
Where did this come from? Why are we doing this? There's a woman who told the famous evangelist Billy Sunday that she had a bad temper. She said, but it's all over with in just a few seconds. Here's what Billy Sunday said. So is a shotgun blast. But in the meantime, it blows everything to pieces. You're getting a sense of that with Haman. He was filled with the seed of hurt. He put it in the incubator of his mind and it had grown and every time he saw Mordecai, it continued to inflame and inflame and grow and now he's at this point, he's thinking, I need to take them all out. He cast lots, he just treated life flippantly and then notice the third thing about bitterness in verse 15 of chapter three. Bitterness can sear one's conscience. It can sear one's conscience. This is the most bizarre thing to me. When I finish with this, and we're going to stop and take a look inside. So verse 15, the couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command. The edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman, you notice this? You following this right here? The king and Haman sat down to drink. Really? I have just edict for millions of people to die. Hey, king, let's have a drink together. Can you imagine that after tossing the dice when you're going to have a couple innocent millions of people killed, grandparents, mom, dads, children, babies. He sits down and says, let's have a drink. That's how calloused bitterness can make people to feel satisfaction and delight in the demise of others And this gets us the idea of how nasty this attitude is. And I look at Haman, I think, man, that is is grotesque. And then I have looked inside. There have been some things that I have personally felt. If I just open up for a moment, maybe you felt some too. You ever see some political figures start to unravel on the large spectacle, figures that you don't like at all? And the first thing in our mind is, oh, isn't that just great? I remember even seeing some entertainment stars that I didn't like. Seeing that they overdosed or took their life and you think in your mind, oh, yeah, That's what they had coming. And I've realized that my sensitivity and care and compassion had waned and I look at my thoughts and I understand I'm probably not a whole lot better than Haman with some of the things I've thought. How ugly this attitude can get. let's talk about it for a moment. How did it all start? For Haman, it started way back when his ancestors, Mordecai's ancestors hurt his ancestors. 
and he let this wound inside go untreated. He allowed it to percolate in his heart, and this is what he ended up with. <clears throat> and here's how I call it. I say, when hurt turns to hate, when hurt turns to hate, the weed of bitterness almost always grows from a seed of hurt. And it begins when someone hurts us and we entertain our minds with the thought of hurting them back. This goes along with the old adage, and maybe you've heard it, hurting people hurt people. When we're hurt, we think, I, I have to get them back for what they've done. And we entertain that thought, and here's a seed of hurt, and it grows and grows and grows. However, bitterness ends when thinking we are hurting them, we are actually hurting ourselves. You ever seen someone who has hurt you in the past and you spend considerable time thinking about maybe what you can do or wouldn't it be great if this thing happened to them. Here's, here's a couple others. Ever lose some sleep about what someone's done to you? You ever, in your time that you're laying in bed, you start imagining their demise and you get the last word and the whole time that you're losing sleep over them, guess what? They're sleeping at their home just like a baby would. You realize that? The more we feed these thoughts, they continue to grow. We never pacify. We never pacify the feelings of bitterness. We only empower them and they get bigger and bigger than we'd ever imagined. And it started from this untreated hurt. And they got the promotion. They told your secret. He said those words. She betrayed your trust. And no matter how this all began, no matter where the source was, when hurt turns to hate, Here's the truth. They are no longer the problem we are. When hurt turns to hate, we're the problem. And I want to give us three final thoughts about bitterness that, that I hope will be a help to you as we finish up. I really think these are these would be a big help. Here's, here's the first check mark, some life lessons on bitterness that I think can help us. Number one, bitterness is contagious. Bitterness is contagious. Have you noticed that? <clears throat> Have you ever been around someone I've had I've had some people do this, and they'll say to me, I'll see someone come by, and they'll say, oh, you shouldn't have anything to do with them. I'll say, why? And they'll say, well, do you know what, what she did to Betty? So I, I, here's what I'll say. Is your name Betty? And they'll say, no. I said, well, then you shouldn't have anything to do with this. Have you ever had it, though? I can't have anything to do with them because they did something to them. And, and it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. Bitterness is contagious. Now, if you want to see a real scary thing, it's not only that it is contagious. If you go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, you're going to find out that in the end days it's contagious. And I'll tell you where the Bible says it's contagious. It's within the church. That's the thing that scares me half to death. The Bible says in the end days that churches are going to be unforgiving, uncaring, and outlines arguments and spats over piddly things that should never be within the church. And this is, this is going to be a center where people don't handle this attitude right. And the Bible tells us we've got we to grab this thing. We, we have to exterminate it within the body of Christ because it is, it's terribly contagious. 
Here's another thing about bitterness. It can't be tolerated. I don't know um, if you're familiar with Matthew chapter 5, but in Matthew 5, Jesus is telling us, um, the Pharisees, some things about their sin in their heart. And one thing he tells them, he says, you know what, if you thought lustfully toward a woman, it, it is as though you've had adultery, but in here, because you thought it, you may not have acted it, but you thought it. And then he mentions this other thing that if you've had anger in your heart towards someone, do you remember what he, what sin, outward sin he equates that anger with? You remember? With murder. So you may not have killed them, but if you've thought that in your heart, if you've harbored this, if you've enacted out things within your mind against these people, it is equated with the sin of murder. The only difference being that we haven't done it in our hand and we've done it in the area though that God sees. God sees what's neatly tucked inside our minds and he takes it very seriously. But here's the last one I want to leave you with and with this we'll finish up. Bitterness ends. And this is beautiful. Bitterness ends when kindness and forgiveness start. Bitterness ends when kindness and forgiveness starts. I, I want to show you, and I, I want you to see it if you can. If you have your copy of the scriptures in your hand, please note this. Let's go there just for a moment. Romans chapter 12. <coughs> Romans chapter 12, it's most of the way through your copy of the scriptures. If you're in the red letter area of the New Testament, you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans in chapter 12. This is so classic to help us navigate through this issue of avoiding and dealing with bitterness. Here's a passage that is a pathway to conquering bitterness. This is so beautiful. In verse 17, the, the writer nails it head on. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give it up. Don't rationalize it. Don't entertain it in your mind. Don't think about doing something to them. Get it away from us. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Here's the beauty. If, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, here's the tough one. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I need to, I need to navigate through this with us. Here the scriptures say, don't merely yank out the weed of bitterness. You need to plant a flower in its place. There's an indisputable fact about bitterness that we, need to that we need to think about. Where forgiveness is, bitterness is not. Where forgiveness is, bitterness is not. Where bitterness is, forgiveness is not. Our best path to beating bitterness is forgiveness. And our best path to forgiveness is, as the text says, kindness. But what about them? That's God's job. That's not our job. But they really deserve something. You know what? God will do a better job than you. Leave it up to him. So if you're thinking through it, some of you might be saying, Pastor, are you telling me I should be gracious to the one who has offended me? 
I should be kind to them and even do positive things for them? Sounds a lot like what Jesus did for us, doesn't it? We offended him in love, he reached out to us. He sacrificed for us and gave us a pathway to come to him in faith. The Bible says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. One has wisely said, he who angers you rules you. If we let the hurt of our lives churn in our minds, they can rule us. They can rule our thought life, our sleeping patterns, our eating habits, our attitudes, our dispositions, our relationships. In bitterness, we carry a burden we were never, ever designed to carry, and it's got to go. Even if the other person doesn't apologize, that doesn't mean you have to carry it around. Let it go. We can't tolerate it. For God's sake, don't tolerate it in your own heart and definitely not in this place of worship. Now, as I finish up, I need your keen attention on this, please. Some here may be operating with the deepest, and I mean deepest, of hurts as in traumatic circumstances or traumatic sexual abuse, I am not being light about your experience. I'm not asking you to look away from justice. I'm certainly not suggesting that you put yourself back in harm's way. Please understand that. And if this is a hurt you deal with, your next step may be to talk to a pastor or to be referred to someone who can help you navigate this situation biblically and wisely, understand that we care. And yet outside of that, for the rest of our hurts that are on the level where life typically operates, I'm going to ask you to do something crazy today. Do this with me. I want you to do something bold. I want you to do something Christ-like. I want you to do something gracious. Number one, I'm going to ask you to forgive. To pardon them. And then here's the the tough one. I want to ask you to plan kindness. Plan kindness. Kindness. Now, don't go too overboard or they'll think you're up to something, okay? And I don't want 10 people to be kind to me this week because I'm going to think I offended that many people. Okay, no one be kind to me this week. But plan kindness. If you struggle with forgiveness, plan kindness. Ask God to place, instead of the seed of bitterness in your heart, the seed of compassion and forgiveness and beat that thing out. Do you have someone in your mind right now? Maybe the person is near to you, even in the room. Can you picture how God may want you to respond to them this week in kindness and forgiveness? Would you just close your eyes with me? I don't want you to talk to anyone around you. And certainly I I really just want you to talk to God And if there's a picture in your face right now in your mind of someone and your thoughts have gone astray and you realize that this is starting to go where it shouldn't go 
and it's consuming you in ways that it shouldn't. And you're thinking things for them that you know God would never want you to think. I know what God wants you to do right now. He, he wants you to turn from that and repent. And he wants you to forgive them and he wants you to meet their need. Between you and God right now in the quiet, I would love for you to tell God because he already knows that you're sorry. And plan with God a way that you'll not be overcome by evil, but that you'll overcome it with good. Would you do that right now? I'm going to give you about 20 seconds. Just you, God, deal with this together. Develop a plan to be crazy, kind, and forgiving. Even if they never ask for it. Here's your, here's your time, you and God. Father, you know our hearts. You know the things that we carry. You know the things that we think about. <clears throat> things that we linger on. Would you help us, God, purify our hearts, clean us from the inside out, help us truly to be void of this, this preoccupation, this bitterness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Chuck Swindoll said, bitterness won't fix itself. I like this. He says, it's like a flat tire or a dirty diaper. We need to do something about it. He concludes with this little story. He says, I remember reading about an eagle that swooped to the ground one day, catching a weasel in its powerful talons. But when it flew away, its wings inexplicably went limp. Bitten by its attacker in mid-flight, Killing the proud eagle as it flew. And then he concludes, if we cling to an attitude of anger or bitterness, we pick up like a weasel something we should never attempt to handle. Something that can easily bring us down. And then he finishes with the easiest advice, although the hardest one to do. He says this, just let it go. Let that thing go. Let's do the same. God bless your week. I hope you get feeling better. I hope I get feeling better. And I pray uh, next week that we'll come back a little more uh, rejuvenated, ready to go. Maybe some burdens lifted as we let some things go this week. God bless you. Have a good one.